that's what you know. Mm-hmm. Oh, Why does it have to show that? Oh, nothing. It's just silly that it doesn't, that it continues to display the recorder. Looks good. Yeah, sorry, it took it was something I should have probably figured out earlier, but it came and checked and looked all right. So, mm-hmm. all right. Sure. So we're six minutes late. I think what then reason still. So um, uh, Oliver Askin, a noted mathematician of international fame and professor emeritus at the University of Illinois at Chicago died on December 23rd, 2008, at the age of 83. He made lasting contributions to the theory of numbers, the theory of uh, algebra forms, uh, theory of partition, and cryptography, among others. He was also a pioneer of the use of computers in mathematics, and number theory in particular. He was born in England and worked at uh, Bletchley Park in World War II. He completed his doctorate at Cambridge in 1952 under John Littlewood, and then he joined the faculty at the University of Illinois at Chicago in 1972. Uh, Oliver remained mathematically active until his death uh, in 2008. The annual Askin Memorial Lecture is aimed at remembering Oliver Askin's lasting contributions to mathematics and the University of Illinois at Chicago. The previous speakers of the Askin Memorial Lecture and Conference were Ken Ono in 2009, Stephen Kudlow from Toronto in 2010, and Lynn Lee Baxter in 2011. This year's speaker is William Klein from the University of Washington at Seattle. He received his doctorate under Hendrik Nanstra at UC Berkeley. In year 2000, he was then an NSF postdoctoral fellow at Harvard and then a DP instructor at Harvard. Then he joined the San, UC San Diego math department and then later he went to the Washington at Seattle. He's written numerous papers, a bunch of books and such, and he's also uh, the founder and director of the Sage Mathematical Cluster. I thank him for uh, accepting the invitation to come and speak to us. There will be a, after I pick up the pencil, uh, there will be a uh, reception, a wine and cheese reception after the lecture at 4.15 in the math department of the SBO building on room 300, followed by dinner in Green Town at Park Mall restaurant. So those of you who are interested in joining us for dinner, please let me know if there's something I should cover this week. Okay. Uh, without further ado, if you have any sort of questions about how to get around, etc., talk to you near the locals. Otherwise, let's uh, invite William. All right, so um, thank you very much for inviting me, and also thanks to everybody here for uh, coming. Since I know you have, you're probably all in the middle of a busy semester or quarter or something. Um, so I'll be talking about, in this talk, elliptic curves over the field Q adjoined square root of 5. And in fact, uh, I'll go back to that in a second. I have two talks to give as part of this conference, talk one and talk two. This talk you're at right now, and it's kind of the first half of the slides that are here. And it's um, a general overview talk about elliptic curves over Q square root of pi to kind of put the question uh, why, do you, why do you consider these in context. And by the way, I'll always just say F as much as I can for the rest of the talk. But in case you forget what I mean by F, you'll always see at the bottom of the slide F equals Q root 5. So I'll be giving that overview talk. And then after that talk on Sunday morning, bright and early, I'm going to talk more about um, specific algorithms and tables of elliptic curves over F and how you make them. So that's how things are divided up. Um, moreover, the talk itself, sort of a lot of the content in here is joint work with other people. Um, so just a big list of names. If you, I'm going to flash the slide by, but if you, whenever I turn around, you'll see the same list pretty much on the back of it. <laughs> so this is a shirt from an RU uh, that I ran last summer with, there are several of the students from the RU right there, and uh, they designed the shirt. And it has a little, it has a bunch of a little elliptic curves over Q root 5 swimming around on it. So uh, my first slide is, a, I have a picture of Atkin and a quote 
Not sure if he exactly said exactly that sentence, but um, Birch basically says he says it in a, uh, another tribute volume to him. And it's, I like it a lot. The object of numerical computation is theoretical advance. And um, that's my perspective very much as well. That uh, the reason that you do computations is to deepen your understanding of some area in the hopes of proving theorems. That's one of the, that's for me my main uh, motivation. I'm not saying that's the only reason for anyone to ever do computations, but in the context of number theory, it's a very good motivator and a good approach. By the way, um, there's a very large pile of papers, which many of these are computer printouts showing numerical data that um, Atkin computed. Apparently, they were all in his office a few months ago, and they're going to be tossed in the bin. They're going to be recycled, at least. But, um, but uh, they were saved, and you can see this huge pile in Taku's office. So if you want to see this, that's the place to go. Um, you'll find all kinds of interesting tidbits in there. Like there's a paper about a conjecture called B the BSD conjecture, um, but it's somebody else whose name starts with a B, and Swinner T. Dyer. So, and then there's like personal letters from Sarah and all these people in that pile. All right, so quick background. Um, elliptic curves, so they're defined by an equation that looks like that, y, uh, cubic plane curve, it's non-singular. There's a picture of what the plot looks like over the real numbers. And the typical sort of thing you might do with an elliptic curve, say defined over the rational numbers, is you could ask for generators of its Mordell Bay group. That's a list of points on the curve, such that if you add them together in various ways, they'll get all the points of the curve in a systematic manner. They're like a basis for a vector space. Um, you can see exam an example here. This is a curve which has rank four. There are four independent points that give you the Mordell Bay group. And here I just took some random little linear combination of some of these generators, and you quickly find a point with big rational um, entries. And then here's the plot that I mentioned before. So that's your background about elliptic curves. I'm not going to say much more about background about elliptic curves, except there's one um, million dollar question that sort of ties together the arithmetic of elliptic curves, and that's something called the Birch and Swinerton Dyer conjecture not the other BSD conjecture that you'll find in, in uh, Tackley's office, um, but the, the actual Birch and Swinerton Dyer conjecture. So that involves a quantity that, whose definition looks much like the Riemann zeta function, except instead of some one over n to the s, you replace all the ones by these numbers a sub n, which are defined by counting points on the elliptic curve modulo various prime numbers. So for example, a sub p is p plus one minus the number of points on the curve mod p. So you define a function like this. It's a theorem that it extends to a holomorphic function on the whole complex plane. It doesn't have any poles. Uh, it has a nice functional equation, et cetera, et cetera. And the amazing conjecture, not fact, but conjecture, hopefully fact, but um, definitely a conjecture, is that the order of vanishing of that L function at the point s equal to 1, which is a very analytic type object, um, is equal to the rank of the elliptic curve. That is the number of independent um, generators needed to generate the Mordell Bay group, modulo torsion. So here, this number rank, um, you can always write E of Q, E of Q being the um, group of rational points on the elliptic curve, as a finite number of copies of Z and then a finite torsion group. And the rank is the number of copies. There's moreover a formula for the leading coefficient of the L series if you look at its Taylor expansion about S equal to 1, and that's what's given down here. And um, without going into any of the notation, what, you've, what, what I've written down here is roughly just a big formula that involves every single or a measure of the cardinality of every group attached to this elliptic curve and kind of multiply them all together and you get a neat identity like this. This is also not known, it's just a conjecture. Um, I'll say a little more about what's known about this. And there are analogs of this for elliptic curves over number fields, for abelian varieties over number fields, or motives over number fields, et cetera. It's very, very general. So I'm um, going to tell you kind of in one extremely ridiculously dense slide about the arithmetic of elliptic curves over Q. Um, so I won't say too much more about elliptic curves over Q after this slide. So um, I'm kind of dividing things up into two pieces, so computation and theory. So regarding computation, there are many different tables. For example, John Cremona, who is right there, has made a table of every single elliptic curve defined over Q of conductor 
up to 234,446, and then a little bit more, because why stop there? Okay, that's where he's really gone. Some people in the audience won't know what the conductor of an elliptic curve is. Uh, don't worry too much. Basically, it's, uh, it's just some positive integer attached to the elliptic curve that is roughly like it's, it's like the discriminant of a cubic. It's something kind of like that. It's a little bit more subtle than that. And a key fact is that there are finitely many curves of each conductor up to isomorphism. So it's a way of, as the name conductor suggests, it's a way of organizing elliptic curves. So there's, you know, there's a list of all curves of conductor one. It's a finite list. We know that. There's a list of all curves of conductor two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So far, all the lists are empty. Nine, 10, 11. Finally, at 11, you have one elliptic curve. And they just keep going. So that's a table. And the reason that uh, John went up to at least 234,446, which he got to exactly I don't know, two and a half weeks ago. Four weeks ago. Four weeks ago, okay, sorry. Four weeks ago. Why time flies um, when you're computing elliptic curves? So um, if you look at these curves ordered by conductor, the first curve of rank zero is the first curve. It has conductor 11. And then there's a first curve of rank one. It has conductor 37. And a first curve of rank two has conductor 39. And then there's a first curve of rank three, conductor 5,077. And finally, there's a curve of rank four. The first one you find is that conductor 234,446. And until a month ago, we didn't know that that was the first curve of rank four. We knew that curve, but we didn't know it was the first one. Uh, so that's one large table. And really, the key, um, one of the key things that distinguishes that table from all the other tables is you get every single elliptic curve of each conductor up to that bound. There's no curves missing, unless there was a bug in the code. But it's assuming no bugs, it's a theorem that there are no curves missing. And it's an extremely deep theorem at that. It uses the modularity theorem that while uh, Ray Conrad, Diane, and Taylor had to prove in order to prove Balmazov's theorem in order to know that this is complete. There's another way to make tables, which um, me and Mark Watkins pushed pretty hard, which is you simply, to remember elliptic curves are just defined by these cubic equations. You can just make up random numbers for the coefficients of the cubic, and you can write down a million elliptic curves you know, in a few seconds if you want to. Um, or you can be a little more clever and systematically search through lots and lots of cubic equations. And maybe you notice some patterns like you know, this cubic equation is always giving your curve of isomorphic to another one. So you can do various things to uh, reduce the number of cubic equations you have to write down. So what um, Mark Watkins and I did was we made an enormous table of curves that have conductor up to 10 to the 8. We estimate that we get roughly half of the curves up to that conductor. Um, but we'll definitely be missing many curves, uh, but we get about 130 million, 136 million. And Doing something similar, we found curves of prime conductor up to 10 to the 10. And we didn't just find the curves. That was you know, one step. But we also computed the uh, order of vanishing of the L function of each of the curves and various invariants that appear in the Birchenstein and Dyer conjecture. So there's an additional large amount of work that you should do if you've computed a big table of curves. And then we computed rank statistics about the curves. And uh, there's a paper in the bulletins of the American Mass Society about that. So um, that's another table. There's another table, or really a paper, that verifies, or a couple of papers that verify the full Birchin Smith and Dyer formula. So I mentioned on a previous slide that formula that ties together all those quantities. It's actually really hard to verify for any cases at all. But what it's done there is it's verified for almost all of the curves of conductor up to 5,000. We have to exclude curves of rank greater than or equal to 2. There are no curves at all of rank greater than or equal to 2 for which the full conjecture is verified. Um, nobody has a clue how to, how to do that. But if you restrict the curves of rank at most one, then um, there is a way to do it. And for all but 11 curves, that range is checked. The full conjecture is verified. And then finally, one other thing you have computationally for elliptic curves over two that uh, I'm putting on the slide at least, is that if you fix uh, the, actually this curve of conductor 389 and rank two, you know that formula up to a power um, up to a, something co prime to p for all primes up to uh, 48,859, except for a couple of primes. There's 19 primes that were computed. But that's only because uh, fast code hasn't been implemented to deal with those primes. So, in theory, one should be able to verify for you know, a large list of primes p that the full conjecture holds. And there's, of course, many other um, you know, intriguing examples of families of curves, uh, various properties, and so on. 
Regarding theory, three of the big things about elliptic curves that one knows is, first, elliptic curves over Q are all modular. Every single one is associated to a modular form. And uh, I won't go into much detail in this talk about exactly what that means, but um, it's really a slightly weaker version of this statement was exactly what Andrew Wiles proved for as a key step to prove for mod um, So that's one thing that you have about elliptic curves over Q. Every single one is known to be modular. A second uh, aspect of elliptic curves over Q that comes from this modularity is that what you do is using the modularity, one can produce, and uh, Hagner did this at the beginning, a large number of points on your curve. And then you can use this large number of points to, um, to basically control the arithmetic of this curve. This goes via the theorem of uh, Dick Gross and Don Zagier and another result of Kali So you put together various theorems and you get an extremely strong result towards divergence of the higher conjecture. And uh, again, this is something that we have over Q, but we don't have uh, in general. And I'll say a bit in a minute about what we don't have in general, but how close we get. So over Q, what you get is that the order of vanishing of the L function is at most one, then you know the projector. Uh, you know the, the range part of the projector. You don't know the formula, uh, but you do know the range part of the projector. Finally, there are many results developed by people such as Cotto, Mazur, Chris Skinner, um, et cetera, that involve Iwasawa theory. So you associate chaotic analogs of the L function that I mentioned before to your elliptic curve. So really you have this whole world of stuff that's associated to any particular elliptic curve. You have for every prime number p, that may be uh, primes of additive reduction, you have a chaotic L function that's attached to the curve, and there's an enormous amount known about that L function. There's an analog of the virtual connection dire conjecture that's uh, of a chaotic flavor, and the theorems are um, very striking. So they're kind of similar to what I stated too, but they're even better. Uh, there's also a classification from the 70s of all the isogenies and possible torsion subgroups of elliptic curves. So as you look at all different elliptic curves defined over Q, each one has this mortal vagus, the group of rational points, and, each, and that group has a torsion subgroup. And so you can ask, what are the possible torsion subgroups that appear? And um, Duffo Levy, like in 1906 or something, made a conjecture about this is the list of torsion subgroups that appear. And then finally in the 70s, very major resolve that conjecture. It's not resolved over number fields, so, um, but it is resolved over some number fields, as we'll see. Also, we know what all the CM elliptic curves are over Q, which is deeper than you might think. A CM elliptic curve is an elliptic curve that has extra automorphisms, and um, it's a very, very rare thing to have happen. Most elliptic curves have automorphism group um, plus or minus one if you're fixing the um, point at infinity. Or if you don't, they have automorphism group C. Okay, so since this is a colloquium, and I might have just uh, lost half the audience, let's return to a sort of obligatory colloquium slide. So I'm going to talk about the field Q adjoint square root of 5, or F, and um, that involves the golden ratio. So here's a, a, a slide that you would see in a colloquium talk. So um, there's a picture that illustrates the golden ratio, and by doing a little bit of calculation, you see that the golden ratio is 1 plus root 5 over 2. It's um, the ratio of uh, the long side to the short side. And um, it's obviously a very important number in mathematics. The golden ratio has inspired thinkers of all disciplines like no other number in the history of mathematics. So, um, that's, if you, there's a popular book on the golden ratio. If you open it up, you'll see that quote. I don't know if that's really true, but certainly a field Q adjoint square root of 5 is, is um, inspiring me a little bit. Um, I don't think that, you know, elliptic curves over Q root 5 are in this book. So what's so great about the field Q square root of 5? Um, so, by the way, there's a definition. It's all A plus B phi, so A, B, or Q. And phi always denotes 1 plus square root of 5 over 2 everywhere in this talk. So uh, one thing that's kind of natural about the field F is that it's the second totally real number field. So the very first, so a totally real number field is, a number field, by the way, is a finite uh, field extension of the rational numbers. A totally real number field is a number field where all of its embeddings in the complex numbers actually land in the real numbers. 
In other words, if you write down a polynomial that defines it, then all the roots of that polynomial are real. So for example, the polynomial x squared minus five, all of its two roots are real. Um, and in exercise, it's not completely obvious, but the, um, if you order totally real fields by discriminant, then the first one's q, which has discriminant one, but the next one is q adjoint square root of five. Um, if you look at, say, quadratic totally real fields, then it's pretty obvious that this is the next one. We have to do a little work to make sure there isn't, you know, why, why isn't there a number field of degree 17 that has a smaller discriminant or something silly like that. Um, but you can get that easily if the cost be down. Another fact about Q root 5 is that it has cost number 1. So the ring Z square root, uh, Z adjoined 5 uh, of integers is a PID. It has unit group that's cyclic um, cross plus or minus 1. So it has uh, it's an infinite unit group. And that's kind of neat because the rational numbers, the only units you have in the rational numbers are plus or minus one. Whereas here in the ring of integers, you have this unit group, which makes many things much more subtle and complicated than they are over the rational numbers, and hence more exciting. One uh, final thing I'll try to convince you of is that totally real number fields are hospitable for elliptic curves in the sense that uh, other number fields aren't, at least from the perspective of the theorems and computations that I stated before. You have a notion of Hilbert modular form, which generalizes the usual classical notion of modular form. So of course, Hilbert's been around for a while, so maybe Hilbert modular form should be considered very classical. Um, here's Hilbert down here. And here's Hegner, by the way, in the middle, and Shimura on the right. So there is supposed to, at least conjecturally, be an analog of the modularity theorem I mentioned before. Extraordinarily useful in understanding the arithmetic of elliptic curves over Q. There's a conjectural analog of it for elliptic curves over any particular totally real field. If you pick the totally real field, then the elliptic curve should be in bijection, elliptic curve up to isogeny, should be in bijection with certain modular points. And uh, there's very strong evidence for this conjecture. And in some cases, it's known, such as Q, of course. Also, uh, given this modularity conjecture, there is an enormous amount of extra structure that you sometimes, in fact, often have on an elliptic curve over F. Not always, but often you have extra structure. But it, it comes via a more subtle and indirect route than what you have over Q. So it can be pretty frustrating to deal with. So summarizing um, somewhat analogously to the situation for elliptic curves over Q, uh, here are some computations and some theory. So first, uh, Richard Pinch is going to talk about some tables, or at least computations. He's done a elliptic curves over two root five. Is Richard Pinch here yet? There he is, right? And this one. So uh, he'll say something in his talk to just advertise it. Um, John Boyd and Steve Donnelly have computed many, many, many um, Hilbert modular forms and equations with some curves. The main thing I'll talk about on Sunday morning is a table of every single elliptic curve over two root five up to the first one that has length two, which has North conductor H and 31. Okay, I, I slightly potentially lie because we don't know the full modularity conjecture over two root five yet. And without that, you don't know that this table is complete. But assuming, complete, assuming that conjecture is to complete this table. Um, also, there's code uh, and algorithms that allow you to compute many of the BFT invariants for elliptic curves over two root five. And uh, we know all the CN curves. It's not a super difficult uh, thing, but um, I'll show you that in a minute. Theoretically, uh, working again with curves over two root five is really, really nice because you have much extra structure. And I think more in, more, in, more in general, you have a lot of extra structure when you consider elliptic curves over totally real fields. But just to nail down some of the people and things that you have, um, Xiaoyu Zhang, proved an analog of the Gross-Sagier formula, but over totally real fields. So there are various hypotheses that are, uh, some of which are mild and some of which are essential, um, that if you have those hypotheses, he's able to push through and generalize all the machinery that I mentioned before over Q to get a similar result. Namely, that if the order of vanishing of the L function of your elliptic curve over a totally real field is less than equal to one, then you know that the order of vanishing of the L function is just the range of the curve. Again, there are hypotheses here unlike over Q, where there's sort of the empty set of hypotheses. Um, but when the hypotheses are satisfied, you get this. So much of the same machinery works. And it's not completely, all completely straightforward to do this. 
Um, there are also modularity theorems due to people like Richard Taylor, Toby G, Mark Kisson, etc., which for many curves tell you that they must come from a Hilbert modular form. Regarding Iwasawa theory and chaotic L functions, um, I actually don't know anything at all. I'm completely clueless. Anybody here know anything about the analogs of Iwasawa theory over the real theory? I didn't know anything, and then I uh, worked on some project with John Coates that made me think maybe there should be something like this. But um, for elliptic curves over Q, there's this construction called modular symbols, which just sort of hands you on a silver platter a, theatic, a construction of a theatic L function. And that's exactly what you don't have over, say, uh, Q root 5. It just isn't there. There's no cusps on the relevant term. Yeah? Uh -huh. Cool. So that's Nike Doppel, who um, is an expert on this sort of thing. So uh, uh, he, he will teach me some more about this tonight. Okay, so first, let's step back and do something easy, which I got wrong every time I did it for a while, but um, here it is. Can be too hard to explain. So um, remember, CM elliptic curves are elliptic curves with extra automorphisms. I'm just going to tell you something about CM elliptic curves <laughs> over the field Q adjoint square root of 5 over F. Okay? So here's a surprise. Um, there are 31 different Q bar isomorphism classes of CM elliptic curves over F. So if you look at real quadratic, if you look at Q, there's uh, 13 different CM J invariants or isomorphism classes. But over this particular quadratic field, there are 31 different ones. You have 13 plus a bunch of more. This is a little bit surprising because if you look at all other real quadratic fields, um, they all the other ones have far less CMJ invariants. So this is by far the record for the number of CMJ invariants. Um, more precisely, here's how this works. You can write down a list of these polynomials called, yes, oh, did it stretch me? Watch out, don't stretch. <laughs> I'm telling you. Okay, so you can write down a, li um, a list of polynomials. These are called Hilbert class polynomials. There are polynomials uh, whose, they're really the minimal polynomial of the CMJ variant. And there are theorems that are very deep, which allow you to deduce that you write down all these polynomials up to some bound, then after a while they're all going to have degree at least three. And so what you do is just write down all the ones up to degree, up to that bound, and then see which ones have degree two and then look to see what um, quadratic fields they have roots in. So this is a little table that summarizes this information. And if you look at the field Q root 5, you'll find that the Hilbert class polynomials that have roots in that field, so these are quadratic polynomials, and they have two roots, and they're in this field, um, are as given right here. So there you are. And notice that there are nine of these. And for each one, you have two roots because they're quadratic polynomials. So 2 times 9 plus 13 is 31. But if you look at other fields, there are far less of these d, so that h sub d has roots in those fields. I guess root 2 is the second place winner, and root 13 is the third place winner. Okay? And if you want to see the actual j invariance of these curves, it's now a command in stage, cm underscore j underscore invariance. And you give as input a field, and it outputs the J invariants. And there are 31 C and J invariants. By the way, this function works in a lot more generality. Um, so it may get pretty slow, but you could give it a cubic field, or a quartic field, et cetera, and get all the C and J invariants in that field. So that's one cool thing about um, F, is that you have lots and lots of C and J invariants. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So images of Galois are related to isogenies. Yeah. <laughs> there is a nice picture of Galois, <laughs> since we don't know anything. Um, but so no is going to give a talk, which I'm trying to advertise right now, since it'll be closely connected, I think, to what I'm going to talk about in the next few slides. And that's a no list stuff because he wasn't since drawing. Very <laughs> you can see he's dressed exactly the same in that picture. <laughs> okay. So um, so now we're returning to questions about uh, all elliptic curves over F. And 
I'm going to tell you some concrete things. I just told you about the key and thing variance. So another sort of concrete thing you'd want to know is what are the coercion subgroups? Turns out the answer is completely known, and it's been known for a long time due to work of Sheldon Kamiani and Najm, um, which is, so for elliptic curves over Q, the complete list of coercion structures that you get is the first two lines there. Z mod MZs for those Ms, and Z mod 2 plus Z mod 2 MZs for the other Ms. So that's what they're in the very major space of the 70s. And the answer over Q root 5 is that there's exactly one more that happens, and it happens exactly once. There's one curve that has coercion subgroup Z mod 6 2 Z. It's just one curve, it only happens once. I'll show it to you in a second. And that's it. So that's the answer. And here it is. Um, take the curve uh, defined by 1, 1, 1, minus 3, 1, and you can see the cubic equation right below it, and its torsion subgroup is Z mod 15. This curve has conductor 10. Uh, a conductor, the ideal generated by 10 is a conductor over the field 3 root 5. Um, it's, as you can see, though, the coefficients of this equation are all actually integers. They're not really you know, you don't really have to go up to the field Q root 5 to see this curve. So we can actually, we can think about this curve over Q if we want for a moment and just type it in. Um, for some reason I deleted the line, but the conductor of this curve is 50 as a curve defined over Q. And over Q, its torsion subgroup has order 5. However, if you twist it by Q root 5, then you get another elliptic curve and its torsion subgroup has order 3. So somehow those two are both sitting inside of the um, torsion subgroup of this curve over Q root 5. And so there you have Z mod 15 B. So this is an annoying curve, say if you want to uh, generalize Wiles's machinery, there's something called the 3, 5 switch. This curve's kind of annoying because um, it has reducible mod 3 and mod 5 representation simultaneously. But it's the only such curve. Well actually, no, I don't know about reducible. It's the only curve with the torsion. I don't know if you can have reducible. Maybe no will tell us in his talk, given the title. Or maybe it's, maybe you know off the top of your head. Yeah, both reducible. Does it happen infinitely often or? Okay, awesome. All right, um, here's the distribution of coercion subgroups. So this comes from the table that um, we'll talk about in my talk on Sunday morning. So what we did was, as I mentioned before, we made a large, lots of little, Relative to tables, but we made a table of elliptic curves over two root five, and we just computed the torsion subgroups of all of them and counted how many times they occur, and there's the list. So um, you can see that there's two torsion quite frequently, and um, I made a similar table over Q, and trivial um, torsion subgroup comes up with much more frequency than it does over two root five. So maybe this is just very small numbers or something. But. I went up to 1,000, so this goes up to 1,831. So the numbers are all pretty small. Also, here are examples that illustrate each of the curves. Uh, they're not the first examples, they're just, um, we were writing a paper and we wanted a table that would look good, so they're examples that look pretty, and you write them down. That's the only criteria. And you can see the 15 one right here. Whoops. Okay. Now, um, I mentioned isogenies before. So, by the way, an isogeny between elliptic curves is a non-zero homomorphism. Okay. Um, I don't know why. The, the key thing is that the zero map, so that's a homomorphism, that, that doesn't count that in isogeny. And um, isogeny is kind of nice. It's an equivalence relation. It's a theorem in the context of abelian varieties where, um, actually, for abelian varieties, you have to require that it's, I don't know, abelian varieties are important. But, um, isogeny defines an equivalence relation. If you have an isogeny, in one direction between elliptic curves, you have an isogeny in the other direction. So, um, so you can divide up the isomorphism classes of all elliptic curves into isogeny classes. And you can also ask questions like, what are the possible degrees of isogenies? So here's a theorem, another theorem that um, Barry proved, which is that if you consider all isogenies of prime degree of elliptic curves to find over the rational numbers, then the biggest degree you'll get is 163. And in fact, at the beginning of his uh, paper, Rational Isogeny is a Prime Degree, there's a nice table which um, lists the known degrees of rational isogenies, not necessarily of prime degree. And most of these 
Well, some of these come from uh, CM elliptic curves that give you some really subtle things, but most of them, uh, well, I don't know, there's a lot that's going on here. But, um, there's a natural analog of this question over F. The question being, fill in the blank. If you consider an isogeny of, say, prime degree for an elliptic curve defined over F, what's the bound on that degree? Very straightforward question. Um, is it 163 again? Are there isogenies to be bigger than 163? Um, what happens? So, as far as I know, nobody knows a specific number that you can put in that blank yet. However, um, there is a theorem of Larson and Weintraub, which says that if you assume the Riemann hypothesis, actually a generalization of the Riemann hypothesis, then there is a constant that you could compute and put in that blank somehow. I don't know if it would take a million years to compute it or if anyone could ever figure out how to compute it, but in theory, you could compute a constant. You're assuming a conjecture and fill in that blank. Um, and this is, I think, the situation for every field besides the rational numbers. So I'm not just asking a question about Q root 5. Well, I am just asking a question about Q root 5, but I think if you put any other field for F there, except for the rational numbers when we are ignorant of the answer to this question. Yeah, in fact, there is one thing you know, that in certain cases, if F is, um, contains the CM endomorphism ring, then you have to put infinity in that blank. So I guess you can answer the question. There is no, there is no um, sort of nice, clean answer for certain fields. But if you restrict to totally real fields, then um, you you can at least conjecture that there's a finite bound here. Well, actually, it's, I guess Larson and Weintraub prove there's a finite bound there under GRH. But um, actually, I don't, I don't know whether they need GRH to prove there's a bound or just to compute the bound. I don't know if anybody, I don't know. I haven't read the paper. <laughs> Sorry. Unfortunately, I haven't read their papers, but I believe it's on the archive. So um, there are many things to read out there. So, uh, but for the purposes of making tables, in other words, if you have one particular curve, and um, often for elliptic curves over Q, uh, when you would read about, you know, how do you find all the curves in the isogeny class, Mazur's theorem would be cited. So we were really worried about this. Um, statement at the top when we wanted to find all the elliptic curves in the isogeny class. What we did when we were making our tables last summer is we'd find one curve, and then we want to fill out the isogeny class, find all the curves that are isogeny fit. And um, fortunately, there's a brand new theorem of somebody named Villaray, which gives you a method for a particular elliptic curve over F, or in fact over any number field, to find all the degrees of the isogeny. It basically just gives us construction that looks pretty complicated, but in the case of quadratic fields, it's fairly simple, um, but in general, it's pretty complicated, of a number such that any isogeny degree has to divide that number. So you just compute the number, and you look at all the factors of that number, and you check one by one to see whether or not there's an isogeny of that degree, and if there is, then you find it, and if there isn't, then you're done. So for any particular curve, you can figure out what all the isogeny degrees are. We just don't know a uniform a priori bound across all of the curves. Yes? Um, there's one other uh, interesting thing that is different between the rational numbers and F, namely that there are isogenies of degree 17. There are lots, well, there are, if you look at um, Barry's table, right here, you see that there is a 17 isogeny over Q, but there are only two of them. There are only two curves with a rational 17 isogeny. If you go to F, then there are infinitely many curves with rational, two iso or rational 17 isogenies. The reason for that is that the modular curve called X017, whose rational points parameterize elliptic curves with the rational 17 isogeny, or possibly cusps, um, over the rational numbers has rank zero, but over the number field F it has rank one. So there's, there's a moduli space that that happens to just coincidentally be an elliptic curve, that elliptic curve has rank one, so it has infinitely many rational points on it, and each one of those rational points gives rise to a rational isogeny of degree 17 between two completely different elliptic curves. 
So, um, and I'm illustrating that here in Sage. You grab the modular curve, you ask for its rank over Q at zero, but if you twist it by five, then you ask for its rank, you get one. And the rank over Q at five is the sum of these two numbers. So amazingly, there are lots of 17 isogenies over F. Is there a question? Nope, you're stretching. Okay, here's another fill in the blank type question. And um, an observation that one will quickly make if you make tables of elliptic curves over Q is that the size of the isogeny classes is at most eight. So see lots of different isogeny class sizes of three. And um, I think it should be a theorem. I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good. The answer is yes, somebody is actually saying thank you. Um, I wasn't aware of that. Thank you. But um, as far as I know, the second question, or the open problem, is still in the blank. What's the largest isogeny class over F? You look at all the elliptic curves over F. You can divide those up into isogeny classes. And you will get some that are of cardinality bigger than 8. So the answer to that open problem is greater than or equal to 8, but it's at least greater than or equal to 10. Here's an example where you have 8 different curves in the isogeny class over Q, but when you go up to Q root 5, you're, you, know, you're, you can have more isogenies, and there they are. There are two other curves that are in the isogeny class. The idea is that there are additional homomorphisms. The kernel uh, consists of points that are not invariant under the Galois group of Q bar over Q, but are invariant under the Galois group of Q bar over Q root 5, a slightly smaller group. So you have additional isogenies. So maybe the uh, largest number of curves you can have in an isogeny class over F is 10, but I don't know. But in our tables that we made, we didn't find anything bigger than 10. So we'll see. Now say, I want to say a little bit more about modularity and just say something slightly more precise. So um, a colloquium style definition of a Hilbert modular form, it's a certain type of holomorphic function on two products of the upper half curve. So that's pretty big, I admit, but um, this modularity conjecture says that there should be a one-to-one -one correspondence between certain Hilbert modular forms, they are in fact rational new forms of parallel weight two, or the field out, and L functions of elliptic curves. So one hopes that there's such a bijection, and there is a hypothesis you can put on the curve which will imply that it definitely comes from a Hilbert modular form. Namely, if you look at the mod 3 representation, so you look at all the three torsion points on the elliptic curve, take that, restrict it to a certain um, subgroup of the Galois group, you have to ask that that two-dimensional representation is absolutely irreducible. If that's the case, then you know for a fact that the, um, that the elliptic curve corresponds to some Hilbert modular form. Unfortunately, some of the arguments that you use in many situations like this become uh, have a hypothesis that root 5 is not in your base field. And root 5 is in the field Q adjoint square root of 5. So you're in trouble there. Um, but I hold out hope that this conjecture will be proved. Um, and I think I increase the chances of it getting proved by talking about it whenever I can. But I don't think I will personally prove it. Probably some student of Richard Taylor will. Okay, and just so you care, um, coming up near the end of the talk, some applications of modularity. I won't go through all of this, but um, why is it useful to know that an elliptic curve is modular? As I mentioned before, once you know that an elliptic curve is modular, you can hope to use a bunch of additional structure you get, like Hegner points, again via work of Jean, to prove things about the Birch and Swinerton Dyer conjecture. It's also very useful from the point of view of just compu for computation, because you know that your tables are complete. You know you have every single curve of a given conductor. Um, this is very important in the context of solving certain Diophantin equations. Samir Siksak has done this a bunch um, for elliptic curves, or in the context of curves over Q, but you can imagine it also being important for Diophantin equations over Q root 5. Um, you can define analogs of the modular degree for elliptic curves over Q root 5, and Ali Dinas is in the back, is hopefully um, doing things for her PhD thesis uh, that involve this definition. Uh, there's ways of constructing chow Hegner points. There's all kinds of ideas that arise in this context that can be explored in a lot of depth in the case of any particular totally real field, and I say Q root 5. 
Okay, now I'm just going to give you a quick preview of my talk on Sunday morning. So, uh, the names that are listed here on the back of the shirt uh, have made a table of elliptic curves up to norm conductor 1831. And the uh, general strategy of how that table was made is that first, using quaternion algebras and linear algebra, you make a list of um, certain uh, Hilbert modular forms. In fact, when you write them down, you're just finding systems of eigenvalues for certain operators. Or more algebraically, you're finding simple modules of a certain module. And you just make a list of these. Then to each one, you, by a conjecture, know that there's a corresponding elliptic curve. And so you just dive in and you find the elliptic curve. There's no systematic method besides a naive brute force search that will definitely find the curve, but in practice, you find the curve one way or the other. Um, and in fact, there's like 10 different ways to try to do this. And then once you've found the curve, which you do find, then um, you can use a whole bunch of algorithms to try to compute all the quantities that appear in the Birch and Sillington Dyer conjecture. And then finally, once you have all those quantities, you multiply them all together and you make sure that the conjecture is consistent. There's one issue. Um, one of the quantities in the conjecture is the order of a certain group called the Shapravich Tate group. And you can't, uh, it's, it's too much to ask to just directly compute the order of that group. It's defined as some mysterious subgroup of a Galois cohomology group. So what you do is you compute every quantity except that one quantity. Then you solve for it in the conjecture, and you hope that you don't get something ridiculous like two thirds, which certainly couldn't be the order of a group. But you'll surely, the first time you do this, get two thirds. Um, and then you'll fix that and get one seventh. And I mean, a lot of things will go wrong. So Ashwath, did you ever get something that wasn't an integer when Negative. computing these? Negative fractions. Negative fractions, okay. So, <laughs> so you know that you're wrong for quite a while, but eventually um, you find many, many bugs and you sort them out. The um, order of the group has to be a perfect square according to a theorem of Castles. And so you kind of um, compute and um, you get a big table of the order, the conjectural orders of those groups. So that's what I'll talk about in my talk on Sunday morning. I'll just outline in more detail these three things, leaving all this uh, theory and overview of the situation to, um, to today's talk. Okay, uh, any questions? That's it. Uh, yes? I did put the word, I put a bullet point for visibility. There are, um, so the, So there's a bunch of um, sort of general results proved about visibility that don't really reference the base field that much. It's like general Galois cohomology stuff. Um, but to be honest, I don't know of one second of actual time anyone has spent looking into that, into concrete examples of visibility, where you have a Shafrayevich Tate group explained by a Mordell Day group. And a nice thing before you do that is to have a table of you know, all curves with conjectural order of Shaw 4, 9, et cetera, which we now have as of, you know, a few months ago. So um, the situation is good if one were to want to make an investigation like that. Um, okay, next question. Yes, John. I don't know. Like this. Yeah, maybe that. Um, that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's a good question. So just to reiterate John's question, I don't know the answer, but um, if you take an elliptic curve over Q root 5, that just happens to be defined over Q, maybe it's easier to. Um, determine the size of the isogeny class over Q root 5. Um, yeah. Yes.
Oh, it's it's um, so there's just a finite list of these modular curves x naught of n that have genus one. Um, there you are. <laughs> That's the list. <laughs> yeah, for parts. Yeah. There are many um, amazing coincidences like this that are that make elliptic curves a great area to study. Yes, uh, Nike. I don't think there is anything in my talk, uh, any technique in the talk that wouldn't work for, that couldn't reasonably be made to work for arbitrary real quadratic fields. I think that's extremely reasonable. Um, it's really convenient when you want to come up with the notion of canonical minimal Weierstrass model, for example. So various things like that, class number one is nice. I, in the talk, it didn't come up at all. It may come up on Sunday morning. It, it should come up Sunday morning. Um, so, but on the other hand, you can, you know, you can get close otherwise. The conductor is always a principal ideal. That's kind of nice, but not critical. Yes, John. Yes. Uh, you, in your PhD thesis. Yeah. Modular symbols. More questions? 